this, as you probably already guessed, is the big interview. I'm Graham. I'm always here, um, like an anchor in stormy seas. Today's guest is somebody I like very much, and it's not everybody who can recount their career and their life and get their character across as firmly as Robert Huth is going to do. Um, he was an exceptional competitor, um, a good footballer for Stoke, for Middlesbrough, for Leicester, for Chelsea, for Germany, and underline it, people, write it in big red letters, a double Premier League winner. He lifted the title at Chelsea and Leicester. This is a way to tell a story about a young man in Berlin. There's hooliganism, there's right-wing behaviour, there's the jailing and the oppression of free speech. There's playing football on what we in Scotland would call red blaze and leaving your skin behind in a sliding tackle. There's judo, there's humility, and there's a move to London where the description of what a vibrant, young, alert, special, special one Jose Mourinho does in terms of inspiration, organisation and detail will take you right into the heart of the Chelsea side which dominated England during those first years of the Portuguese man of war taking over at the bridge. Robert Huth wasn't just a witness, he was a participant. and He was very, very good at what he did. Robert Huth is going to talk about maybe one of the great undervalued players of modern times in N'Golo Kante. Um, a serial winner, somebody who made Leicester a title winner, Chelsea a title winner, and who made France world champion. How can it be that otherwise astute judges are failing to understand his vital importance? Remember that Robert played behind uh, Claude Makaleli and played behind N'Golo Kante, and he can make an educated comparison about the two of them. I also thought that it was an undertold part of Robert's story that he was a German international at a time of splitting of the atom might be too much, but at a time when Germany, certainly the Mannschaft and the DFB, began to shrug off their old coat and don a new sports jacket. They hired Jürgen Klinsmann, much against the wishes of many of the German media, many of the old-fashioned guys in the DFB. Along with them came Joachim Lowe. From 2004-2005, they began to reinvent German international football, which led to a splurge of semi-final and final appearances, and of course, ultimate victory in the World Cup in Brazil in 2014. I think that Robert's part in that um, will be interesting to you, particularly in the Confederations Cup, playing against greats, um, making his debut in Berlin, his home city, against Brazil, playing... Ronaldinho, Adriano, the original, the real Ronaldo. And also, uh, a night in Dortmund, a night in the middle of the steamy World Cup that Germany hosted in 2006. It's the semi-final, Klinsmann's Germany take Italy, Lippi's Italy, to Signal Iduna Park. And one of the most coruscating, thunderous, brilliant football nights this planet has ever seen takes place and unbelievable things happen. In this instance, Robert's not in the pitch. Well, he nearly was, and he tells the story properly. Listen to it. You'll love it. This is the big interview. For once, um, we're relying on the audio uh, from our Zoom recording. This being a pandemic, we still aren't face-to-face -face with our guests across the table. I wish we were. Safety first, not a motto I've always believed in, but it's enforced at the moment. And that means that there will be the occasional crinkle in what you hear, simply because of the airwaves getting a little bit shirty. Other than that, it's perfect sound for a perfect guest. You're really going to enjoy Robert Hoot. When you do, leave a review for the big interview. It's a way of letting other people know about it. Better still, old-fashioned, get out the uh, messenger pigeon, the tom, tom drums, or just tell people about it. Okay? Message clear? Enjoy. Big interview, uh, listeners. Um, apart from regular interviews, I don't know, 106 now or whatever it is, we try to bring you people whose um, character and achievements combine to make me admire them. I was lucky enough to spend a day in the presence of Robert Huth during what we like to call the summer in Britain, and it was fabulous. And for some 
unknown reason, he's agreed to come and talk to us. Mr. H, um, I don't know what time of day in Germany, because it varies here in Spain, whether you say uh, good morning or good day. So you can say buenos dias, buenas tardes, and everybody gets. So if we were in Germany, would I say uh, guten Morgen or guten Tag? Uh, good morning. Yeah, I'd say similar rules. Once it gets to sort of 12 o'clock, it changes to guten Tag. But good morgens. As it's still 10.30 UK time, we say good morning. It's a firm good morning. Yeah, and uh, no, without normally you get a solid handshake with that as well, but obviously uh, rules are on the line at the moment, so it's just a good morning. I'm going to give you a solid wink just to, yeah, that feels almost as good as a firm handshake. Fist pump, yeah, fist pump these days, isn't it, or elbow. <laughs> uh, Robert, I had it in my mind um, to begin asking you about a childhood in Berlin because it's a city where I've only been fortunate to be two or three times and it's caught my attention and it's caught my um, enthusiasm and even though you hadn't spent a massive amount of time in your life there, it is your roots. But we have got people who we call socios, it just means they're our members, they're wonderful people who are, they're like season ticket holders and they've been with us to support the podcast and one of them, uh, Richard Pigton, um, wrote this. Hi Graham, hope you're keeping well. Looking forward to this big interview. Robert is a big cult hero in the big Doug Rugby. Rugby was a player played for Aberdeen and Chelsea in the Rugby Mold down at the bridge. The home game against Charlton in 2005 was the last of the season and the trophy lift followed straight afterwards. For us, there were two highlights that day. One was Makaleli scoring his first goal from a penalty rebound. And the other was Robert tearing around the pitch in a groundsman's truck. <laughs> this is the bit I love. With various players hanging on the back for dear life. He was causing complete chaos to all of those around him. Can you ask Robert for his memories of the day and that incident, please? Yeah, many people, you know, just come up to me like, what, what got into you? But, you know, obviously we, we won the league and everyone wants like, just, you know, mega happy and all that stuff but with you know with football clubs you you tend to know all the groundsmen you know they're always at the training ground and then they work at the at the at the pitch so i always had a thought of want to drive one of these buggies you know why not and uh as we've done all the presentation and stuff i just saw this buggy there with the keys in it and i'm thinking who's stupid enough to leave a buggy with the keys in it and i sort of knew how to drive it anyway because i had a, had a couple of goals at the training ground so just run over Obviously, got it all started, got going, and as people sort of saw me driving, I just sort of jumped on top of it. We ended up with the trophy on top of it, and the funny thing was, I think at one point, we had the groundsman chasing us. So, obviously, you know, you, you get egged on, don't you? You go fast, and we slow down, and they caught up with us, and then we accelerated again, and so it was, it was a good sort of 10, 15 minutes where uh, we had a bit of fun with it, but yeah, an absolutely epic day. Was that, was that squad full of imps was it full of people who liked a laugh because it felt like i mean as a footballing unit you were well coached you were full of talent you don't achieve what you did there without those ingredients but i think the composition of the mentality of a squad varies sometimes very serious sometimes don't talk to each other and not that keen on each other apart from training and games but that one felt like a, a squad full of imps people with a little sense of life to be enjoyed yeah, I mean, you know yourself, when you have fun at work, it tends to be a lot better, isn't it? And you get better results, and I think that was the case. Um, I wouldn't say they were all sort of, you know, friends, but, you know, we had that sort of mutual respect where we could have a laugh, but ultimately it was still very performance-driven. Um, and that sort of, it, it makes, everything makes it easier if you if you win. You know, I've never seen a winning team being unhappy. You know, they always laugh and they always have tell how fun it was to play in a team. It tends to just be in teams where, where you don't win. So the fundamental basis of, of sort of the fun part of, of playing for Chelsea at the time was was winning because the second you lose, everything becomes sort of, you know, clouded down and the fun stops happening and, and people start to judge you when you laugh, when you lose, don't you? You see it all the time, you know, when, when you know, when people are on a, on a losing streak, oh, why is he laughing here? Well, you know, it's still life. You can still allow to have a laugh, but... Fundamentally, you know, the winning, the winning that what makes it a good team, really. 
um, and that's the basis of it, really. What was the what was the advantage to you? I like the phrase you use, performance driven. You were working um, for a coach who was extremely focused on that, and also did things that at the time. I know it sounds strange now, but his attention to detail and the degree of which he would. Um, fill your minds with preparation which I imagine, I guess had two purposes it's like a Marshall McClure and the medium is the message apart from saying your opponent does this, your opponent does that weak spots, positive spots, likelihood to go on this foot, that foot, blah 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 the actual process of learning about the next opponent directly and the next team is also a, a blinker method, a focus method, if it becomes repetitive then it just keeps you really simmering rather than uh, it's, and a lot of players come to, uh, for example, we sat down with uh, Benny McCarthy and he was talking hilariously about Carvalho and saying, shit trainer, often sent home by Mourinho on a Monday or Tuesday. Like, I don't know what he called him. I don't know if it was Shirley or whatever. You're useless. He said, worst trainer. And I've heard that worst trainer story across different clubs and cultures, but they always end with Saturday, Sunday, Somewhere from seven to nine and a half all the time, focused. But not everybody's like that at all, are they? No, no. And I think that's the secret of, of a good coach. You know, like I'm, I'm obviously retired now and I've not taken the coaching sort of route that sort of many ex-players do simply because I, if someone isn't the same personality as I am, I would struggle. I always have struggled with players that sort of, like you said, the ones that train shit. We always end up arguing and I couldn't get it. Um, which was okay because I was playing I was sort of within a group but if I was the leader of the group I would lose my shit you know like I, like you said send him home or find him and I, I would genuinely struggle to understand that sort of personality but yeah I mean it's all good having one player having that attitude you know like our training is not that important but ultimately if you have 10 of them you know, you, sometimes you say these brilliant teams, you've got that one player that, you know, that does a bit of magic and you let them get away with um, with maybe not working as hard defensively, but, you know, all that stuff. It's great. I think it's there's a real sort of place for players like that. But to have five, six of them in your team, that's not going to work. You know, you need the ones that, you know, when you come, when it gets to Monday and you analyse the game, you need the ones focus on, on the uh, past mistakes, how to how to improve, how to organise yourself for the next game, and so on. And that needs to be uh, the number of that sort of players needs to be a lot higher than the ones that sort of just go go with the flow. Because um, sport, ever since I've started, you know, the, the details become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, I can only imagine what it's going to be like in ten years' time with with all the stuff that's out there now. Um, gone. I, I admit that I have differing views about Arsene Wenger. And that's normal in either a human being or a high achiever, which he is, he's a high achiever. But I was, I was reading him recently um, talking about a theme you touched on there, that, that now he reckons football is kind of at the peak of physical excellence, recuperation, dietary planning... And it's kind of, I, I, I'm interpreting now, he, he kind of had it as if you, if you made it a, a car analogy, you, the pedal is to the floor and the needle's approaching red. And it would just generically, we're probably as far as, he said neuroscience is going to be the next big leap forward. It's going to be about positivity or speed of reaction or who's got the greater mentality, which one, I think, m matches with your thin margin, thin margin. And two, your little leap ahead about... I wonder what it's going to be like in 10 years, given how tightly we're focusing on details that are, I think, pushing athletes in, in your sport. I think we're treating shit. I think we're like, give me more, give me more, give me more, you're a commodity. And I, I, I worry about, in your 10-year prediction, if we don't adjust ourselves a little bit, that, that we're, we're, we're burning people up physically and mentally, or at least I think we're on that, that road. Which of those points you want to pick on is up to you. But th th that's honest... That's, those are honest perspectives from me. Yeah, I mean, in terms of physical, I mean, we, we always have that conversation. It can't go any better. It can't get any faster. It can't be. And somehow we end up getting faster. It, you know, it's, it's a, I know what you're saying. There, there has to be, or I, don't, I don't know whether there has to be, but, you know, your brain and my brain sort of work maybe similar in a way. Of, it's some, somewhere it has to stop, isn't it? You know, you know how fast can Adam Toro be? Can, he, can someone be as fast as him and still play football? I don't know. 
no idea. But in terms of how the game is going, you know, all the virtual reality stuff, well, not all of it, but there's quite a few stuff out there where you can, you know, the, the stuff with the goggles where you can re-watch games and you, you can put yourself in a room and you can watch yourself from a different position um, and sort of really watch a game back or even in other games, it's you can sort of watch yourself from being on a pitch to then being from up there. And this gives your, like I said, your neuroscience a little bit of something to think about where, right, what's that pass the right decision or what's my positioning correct? And then you got that vision where you are physically the player and then you also have lots of other different, it's not like video because you get all the, the head movement, you're looking down. So in terms of that, the, the game intelligence is gotta go, it's gotta go up. I think just by by that, you know, because if you have the ad- advantage of a position, you know, football is just about positioning. Well, not just, but it's a lot about positioning and sort of getting in between the players and blocking passes. If you have the physical um, side of it and the mental sort of intelligence, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it's just gonna go up. It feels almost. You know, going from velvet to cardboard, going back to the lower tech of what Mourinho introduced to you guys. But at that time, was it impactful um, that that you were being given so much information? And did you react positively, negatively to it? And how much did it help you? I was 18, I think, when he came. For me, it was an absolute game changer because I've gone through pre-seasons where you run the first two weeks, you don't see the ball. Um, you just trying to be as fit as you can, blah, blah, all the, you know, you would have heard all that nonsense. So when he came in, it was a complete game changer. It was not it opened it all up, you know, it was specific training, uh, not wasting any any time in training. The times he, when we didn't train, he, he said, if you don't want to train properly, just go in. We start again, and he wouldn't hold it against you. But he, his sort of belief was, when we train, I want you to get something out of it, and I need you to get something out of it because. The end goal is the, is the Premier League, the winner of the Premier League. So we can't waste time with shit training sessions or sort of um, bad attitude or you're just going through the emotions. That wasn't that wasn't allowed. But for the players at the time, I think the players that were a little bit older than me, they got to the point where this is shit. There's got to be a better sort of method, preparation, and when he came in, I mean, their eyes just lit up. They went, what? We, you know, they really, and you could see for the first, you know, three, four years, they were miles ahead. You know, I, obviously it's difficult for me to say how other teams trained and prepared, but, you know, just for defenders' point of view, like we had, we got given sheets on a, on a, on a, on your training seat with information about the players. Like, I love that. Uh, you know, that was like, well, that's that's the level of intensity and level of preparation you need to to have success in sport. And he, Mourinho, obviously took it to a new level. You know, with, with with training, it was it was always time. There was there was no wasting. We had ball boys for training, yeah, and that was oh, we now 2004. It was, you know, normally when you do any sort of training, there was you know lots of time was wasted. People take a breather. The ball's over there. Everybody goes. Oh, whereas if the ball's in play all the time, you're always thinking. You're always sharp. Yeah. Yeah. The, so the, that wasn't time. There was no wasted time going from different exercises. We the, the the pitches were prepared. So you finish your possession training, and then the drinks were positioned. So on the way over to the other side of the pitch, you grab a drink and you sort of recover while you walk across to the different exercises. And that would that that never happened in my sort of early part of professional playing. It was just like, well, it's hang about here for five minutes while the coaches set up another drill, and you lose the momentum, you lose the intensity, intensity. But yeah, I mean, yeah, he really opened it up, and he sort of um, made me realize. I mean, I was always hard working anyway, but um, he made me realize what it really takes to be to be on it. Um, and I'm glad I, I got it when I was 18 because that sort of level of preparation I sort of took took throughout my life really and still still to this day I think when you're near anybody in any professional arena that's got such intensity preparation has clearly thought about your role other people's role you watch it and first of all your respect meter goes up a little bit you feel more engaged but on a separate level um, I, I don't think he's replicated this throughout his career but you encountered a man there 
who, who was very messianic. He, he had something about his his devilishness, his his wit, his his the, the stuff that uh, Duffer told us about flying back from. Um, I, I don't know if you were on this flight, flying back from whatever a game to, to win in in Russia, and qualifying through the group. And Mourinho saying to every, they were like, "Boss, boss, who do you want? You want Barcelona? I want Barcelona." He's like, "Yeah, yeah, we'll beat them. We'll beat them. We'll beat them." Draws Barcelona, knocks them out. Little things like that that you encounter on a daily basis. At that stage in his career, he was messianic. He kind of oozed uh, cleverness and confidence and a sort of elan. A, a, a sort of he stood apart, not special ones yet, but he was a different kind of guy. Is that the guy you encountered and worked for? Yeah, and I mean, as much as um, as we give him credit for for his methods, but he was, or oh, he is, very intelligent. You know, like when you when you lead a, a group of men, or a, a, I'm only I can only talk for men because that's my game. But you know, it's you playing games. Like it, had he had said, "Oh, we want the shittiest team." The, the mindset of the team would have been different. So he, even if he doesn't believe it, <laughs> you know, that, yeah, that they yeah. could beat Barcelona or they could beat Real Madrid. When you speak to the group or individuals, you, you just make make it up, even if you don't believe it. And then next thing you hear, him, yeah, we, yeah, we can beat Barcelona. His attitude just goes for the group. And he, he wasn't allowed to have any sort of dull moments or even when we lose you know, it was always a fluke, you know, <laughs> or the ref was shit, or, you know, it was never, it was always stuff, well, we only lost because, not because of us, you know, it was a that mindset, you know, the constantly driven and just confidence. My, the same with my children, when they're a bit down, you know, it's always a bit, you, you just give them positivity, you know, believe in them when they have a big exam for schools or something. It's, it's very similar to that, and that's exactly what he did. It's infectious. Why do I describe football dressing rooms? I often use this metaphor, and you can tell me I'm wrong. But it's like you know having a swimming pool, a big swimming pool full of a couple of sharks. And if you just show the little bit, tiniest drop of blood, the sharks will be on you. I've always felt that with coaches and managers, that's often the predominant relationship with a dressing room. The, the really elite guys maybe have a dressing room or a squad eating out of their hand or fearing them or inspired by them for a certain time. But, you know, one man, because we're talking about the men's game, as you make the point, it, maybe it applies to women's game, maybe it doesn't, neither you and I have enough experience. But one man and a group of 24, you, 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 that one guy has to outthink the 24 all the time or spellbind them or inspire them. Or otherwise, what is it about groups of men in sporting situations that go like, he's lost it. By the way, listen, I don't think he's... You know, that happens, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean... <laughs> You know, you're following him blindly, aren't you? Because you, you, you're believing in, 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 first of all, the goal, then the process and, and whatever needs to be, be doing. And I think it's once you've got a core group of, you know, these sort of alpha males, you know, the, when you step into the training ground, it, it's work time. It is infectious for all the other players. When you have a bad day and you see everyone being pumped up, you don't really be a, that one guy that's sort of, down or you, you can't afford it like you said it's it's you're being judged every single second on on a training pitch or i always felt like that anyway um so even when i had a, a couple of knocks or had a couple of bad games or whatever or would send off or scored an own goal you know on monday morning you got to get in there and just go you know it happens but you know it goes on you, you can't sort of well in my time anyway i never sort of seeked uh reassurance anything you know always on the front foot and most change rooms are like that or the ones i played in anywhere where you know the the the, the weakness isn't allowed you know um but obviously now it's a bit different yeah we're in an era where football's trying to be more inclusive and look out for the guys who fall through the cracks and aren't just a little bit soft but are struggling and there wasn't a lot of room for that in the sport that I, that I grew to knew in the uk particularly in the uk i think when you say alpha male i think that's something that Finding that blend of how to be like that, remorseless and alpha, but also be aware that some people that are talented just aren't built that way. It's a difficult one because no one, I mean, I don't know what, how people struggle or, or anything like that, but I, I wouldn't know how to deal with that, if I'm honest, you know, and I wasn't probably the best teammate for people that were struggling because I was probably, or I didn't understand it. I just, I was, I was always mm. in my sort of growing up was like, just get on with it, get your head down and, 
and get to the place where where you can be happy. Um, but my upbringing is or was definitely different than than people that have been brought up today. We've got sponsors. They're three six five. They 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 back us at this um, podcast, and they've asked. They've sent me a selection of questions. The one that f- feeds nicely off our chat about Mourinho was. Bet365 asked me to ask you, throughout your career, if you had to choose, with which manager did you strike up the best relationship? I'm guessing they're meeting a personal one, I'm guessing. I, I, I think so. Um, I, I never did. It was always professional. It was always um, get to work, do your work, um, and then any sort of social side of it, or how's your kids, how's your, how's your family, and all that stuff. For my, I was never interested in it. I always sort of thought he was my boss. Um, again, growing up in East Berlin, like you mentioned, it was very sort of, you know, your boss is your boss. You do what you say, what he says, apologies, and you don't sort of question it. That was my upbringing. And I sort of, I, I kept with that. I didn't want to interfere with it because it was just, I always thought it would get messy. And I also would think that people would judge me if I speak to the manager outside of football. You know, it was always football-based performance-based, uh, mistakes, uh, things that I'm well, how to improve, all that sort of stuff. It was never, should we go for a cup of coffee after training? I, I personally had no interest uh, and I've, I've, I've felt uncomfortable as well because as much as it was my passion, it was also my job. Um, I just didn't, I never wanted it to be anywhere in between. You're sitting there with um, a tremendous reputation, two different title wins. Um, it worked for you. But you've twice now mentioned, uh, I hope I've got it right, in Beersdorf. Beersdorf. I'm not saying that very well, actually, um, in East Berlin. And I just, for as much as it interests you, I'd really like to understand your neighbourhood, the condi- because it conditions all of us, I think. And I'm at an age now, and I've lived abroad for 20 years, where I think rather differently about the things that I wanted to escape when I was a kid in Aberdeen. And maybe that's a romanticism that you don't share. But I do want to know, for example, if you were to picture yourself now at any given age, whether it's 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and you were to try and transmit to us and, and all the people listening about a sight or a sound or a smell of, of growing up in your part of eastern Berlin, what would the things that would that, that are in your head and in your soul and in your consciousness and maybe the, maybe things that help shape you? I don't know. East Berlin is very sort of what well, is very concrete. Everything was just concrete. Wherever I looked was even now when we go back, it's still that the whole grey sort of. I, I was never I never felt like I needed to escape it. Um, it was very rough. Um, it was very sort of a sort of right wing sort of place where there were loads of hooligans around. Um, not a not a lot of sort of foreign cultures. So it was very German. You know, everyone in your neighbor was German. The one down the road was German. We lived in a 20-story apartment block. I shared a room with my sister till I moved out to 16. But yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, I, I played, you know, football on gravel. Because um, all the sort of, once the war went down, all the money, the infrastructure got spent on on, on the west side of, of Berlin. So my early part of, of training was, to, you know, the, I don't know if you know, the really sort of thin gravel we, I, I, I've had several skin gravel. You grew up in Scotland. Our thin gravel is red, and and when the temperatures below Caribbean, it freezes, and it's like sandpaper. So you just say goodbye to your skin. Sliding tackles, yes, but your jeans stick to you for two weeks afterwards. Are we talking the same language? That's exactly <laughs> the same one. Yeah, uh, sliding in was was not a good idea. But yeah, so I played pretty much till about fourteen on on, the, on these sort of pitches. Uh, or training anyway in the winter because sometimes we were allowed to train on the grass and then we had to go when it gets too cold or too wet and too muddy we we which was often the case obviously in, in the winter months we had to play on gravel and i've still got scars now like you said where it's wait 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 i can't I, I can't resist this so if you'd had um what you call it virtual reality goggles then and the coach was saying to you right there's the ball there's the man and and look at the surface and there's so the, the audio visual coach is saying you look at the surface robert would it have changed your idea if you saw the ball at 14 you're like you're still going in anyway aren't you i mean you just are yeah 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 you go in hard don't you because you don't feel it <laughs> but yeah i mean that was just grim but it's it's just part of what shapes you isn't it when you when you're young and you just sort of i never looked at it no this is rubbish i just thought yeah man. This is the card you've been dealt. 
um, and just get on with it. Yeah. When you talk about a rough neighbourhood, that's something that a lot of the people, definitely not all, but a lot of the people in this interview, are probably the, the farthest away was Luca Viali, who Luca grew up basically as landed gentry in, in, in a chateau in, in northern Italy. So he's probably at one extreme end. But a, a large proportion of those who've either made it as coaches or footballers in this interview series have had something that would compare a little bit to, to what you went through. And I want to know if, if I've got it wrong or, or, or what the correlation is between it being a little bit bumpy around your streets, I don't know, for the journey to and from football or the journey to and from school, and you're opting to, to, to take up martial arts, I, th- I think judo. Was there a correlation there? And what effect did learning martial arts have on young Robert Hood? It was self-protection as much as sort of I, I wanted to do it because it's crazy. Because I've got two kids and I basically had to travel for an hour when I was at a young age to get to school. Um, by bus, walk, uh, early in the morning when it's dark and, and late at night when it's dark. So that was very sort of more of a protect yourself just in case something ever happens. But when you when you step into sort of a gym, it's it's humbling because I was always well, taller than average. So I never really got into any trouble. But when you step into a gym and you get in your ass whipped by someone who is <laughs> half the size and half your white, it's very humbling. And you're starting to respect people a lot more. I did anyway. It, it gives you the confidence in, in certain situations that just in case it was ever going to escalate, you have got that skill. And I think it just breeds confidence, uh, self-assurance. Um, and like I said, you, you, you respect opponents, whether they're, when, they, when you go into football, whether they're League One, League Two or Championship or whatever league they're playing or, or whatever, you, we respect because you, you know you've been on the wrong side of a beating. And that's very humbling. I think it's great. I think lots of kids should do it because, <laughs> yeah. Uh, not many people are um, getting to lose these days. You know, it's a very sort of easy upbringing. You know, everything is great, everything this, or try a bit harder. You know, you just need to read school reports. I mean, my reports were like, well, he was rubbish at this, rubbish at that, decent at that. And now everything is like, well, he tries really hard. And it's that sort of victim nonsense that's going on at the moment where... Soft, soft. Everything's too soft for thing for people, right? Yeah. And I'm not saying be an arse or anything like that. Just... Bit more realization where what well, it's tough, yeah, it is tough, and you can't be good at anything. You can try, but the outcome is not going to be always the same. Someone's going to be bigger, smarter, better at maths, better at football, but you know, as long as you know about it, it, it gives you a good platform. Two things you mentioned there that seem to me to link. We're talking about beer stuff, and I got one more question about your growing up. But I, I feel you've inspired in me. Like one, we we've stopped saying to people that to try and fail doesn't make you a failure because if you don't try, you don't win and, and failure teaches you. So, all right, it's still sore. It's still always going to make you feel humiliated. But you, And also you used when you, I don't know if it's a judoka you stepped in, you called it the gym. You talked about humbling, about respect was the word. I think two things, really two big things, uh, and, and I'm applying this as I think you were subconsciously to, to the generations of footballers who are coming up behind you where they probably don't have solutions because the majority of them haven't had it shitty enough to go, I've got to fall back on my own resources, my own personality. I haven't just only got to toughen up. I've got to find out ways to deal with the shit that comes my way, whether it's in life, whether it's in school or whether it's on the pitch. These are the things that you are talking about, aren't you? Right, yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah. so in the, the later part of sort of playing and you, you play against the sort of academies, you know, they, or you, you, a training match against the uh, under 18s or 19s, and and you watch them play. And once you take their strength away, you know, sort of, sort of, just take Leicester as an example, um, under 18s or whatever it was, 19, whatever it was, they had a really one way of playing. They've been taught that, but they coached that day in, day out. And then they play against a team that goes, well, we're going to batter your strength. We're going to take that away from you. And no one knows how to deal with that then. They all just look at each other, I got on a pitch, and I was watching because I was injured. I was thinking, but no one knows how to take control of the situation now where the opponent is on top of you and they figured a way out how to stop your way. Now what? And by over teaching all these sort of, you know, this way is the right way to do it, you know, it, it limits players, it, limit, it limits their upbringing. You know, you, the, I, I see it now, the young players coming through, they don't get taught. Everything is sort of so set in training and, and you know, these sort of, this needs to happen for this. Uh, and just to bring it back to judo, 
when you or in martial art, when you fight someone, it's the same weight, the same level of skill, uh, within sort of reason. But you know, you're at the same level. You're just gonna have to figure shit out. When you go through your coaching stuff from uh, from the FA, I mean, they all teach the same stuff. You know, whether it's the the B or the A uh, A license, it's just a ticking box sort of exercise. So th- it doesn't really bring out anything great in coaches either. I don't know if you were watch any lower leagues here they all do the same thing now where the center backs split and they play the you know like the five yard pass outside the six yard box and like that why there's got to be other ways of playing football not to just just lump forward but that's what i mean everyone's playing um the same sort of football throughout the leagues and the reason why i think cabin luna at the moment is is doing so well because he's he's a little bit when I say old school, I don't mean it in a negative way. I mean it in the best positive way. He gives it to the centre backs, and the centre backs going, "What's going on? I've got this big number nine here now, who's jumping into me, chesting the ball down, running the channels," and they're like, literally, kind of going, "Shit, I don't know what to do." And Kevin um, Lewis, he's brilliant. He gets in the box, gets his elbow out, heads one in. Thanks very much. Rub on the head for the centre half. Because he's, he's gone old school. He's gone, I'm physical, I'm smart, I know how to run the channels, I know how to drop deep, and I'll spin behind. He got, he got, he got, he's got it covered. And defenders don't know how to do with it. And he's, yeah, old school in a new school way. Which for England, if that's a compliment to Harry Kane's pretty established, very different from what you've just described, and good at his job, and good at finishing. His finishing is very high level. But that paints as a complementary partnership because they're extremely different but, off, but, but both very good at what they do. Calvert Lewin is, is going to enjoy and, and maybe some of it is to be to be a I don't know but one of the things that Ancelotti has brought to every squad that he's coached is a different mentality. He, he is notoriously good. He's, he's a very organised qualified football coach. The thing that separates him is that he gets the best out of individuals. He design, redesigns a system for them, or he's got one-on-one coaching with them. He's a, he's a magnificent person. He's an interesting person. And and there must be some Ancelotti effect on what you're enjoying in Calvert-Lewin, I, I suspect. Two things I, I want to do, and, and again, this is only if you're interested, but I I, I was interviewing Rista Stoichkov two or three days ago. He was in Miami, Zoom like this. Fascinating, because he's, a, he's an intricate man who played with great skill. And, and when I was... You know, a younger journalist. He was one of the key guys I went to watch, and I talked to him about moving from Sofia to Barcelona, and he said he said an interesting thing. He said, I, "On the day that I signed, I, I said I was the happiest man in the world, not just because I was joining Barcelona and Cruyff had signed me. I'd played against them in the cup in a couple of year before. I'd waited for a year. I hadn't told my family that it was going to happen. That case it all went to tits up. But he said, one of the reasons I said I was the happiest man in the world, he said, it was it, life in Sofia in 1988-89 was, was hard. You, you had secret police with you, maybe not interfering in your life all the time, but following you abroad you know, on trips and if you were playing in companies and where. He said, I felt that it was a release, that the world was going to be new. I, I could actually be me when I moved to, to Barcelona in 89-90. Did... did, did is any of that recognisable? Maybe not to you, I don't know, but to your parents. Was there, were there things that conditioned them? Because they've obviously conditioned you and your attitudes and, and, and how you've approached young life and adult life. Did, did, did the things he's related about, just a, um, a sense of being mm, oppressed, watched, mm, uh, channelled by your society, which we didn't really have... The same, we had it in other ways. But is, is that recognisable to you or to your parents? I mean, I was just at the end of it all, sort of. I was born still with the wall being up, obviously. Um, but, yeah, my parents would have done, yeah. My, my, my dad went to prison because he, he got spied on and he was he was slagging off the establishment. Um, so they actually locked him away um, just before I was born, actually. Um, so, yeah, there was always um, very, what's the word I'm looking for? You, authority, you know, like you don't, yeah. you don't challenge. You just, you do. And Germany is just about getting out of that now, where it's it's a bit more liberal, a bit more sort of openness. Um, but yeah, my part, you know, you don't, in my view, you don't sort of challenge authority. You know, they're very dictators still. Um, and it's um, 
certainly with a in a you know a nice way of being in England where it was a lot different. Everything was a bit more sort of open and relaxed. But of course, um, you know, you, your parents instill so much in you from what they know or what they thought was right or wrong. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm sure I've got. Uh, when you think of all these German traits, I probably still got. 100% of all of it. The last one from 365. If there is a forward, one forward ever throughout your career, that you'd wake up in the morning and, and think, this is the guy I'm least looking forward to facing again. Was there such a species? But also, if there were, who, who would that have been? I think that there's two conversations to have. The ones that, that conversation that goes in that little brain of mine where when I was playing goes, shit, I'm actually scared. And the ones... When you speak to people, go, nah, there's got to be fine. The one I'm going to give you now, uh, I didn't fear anyone. But uh, no, of course, I mean, Dropper was always the one the nightmare. Uh, I didn't look forward to playing against him at all because he had, like, not only did he have the, the game intelligence of, of avoiding of sometimes uh, getting tackled or getting in positions where people can nick the ball of him, he also had the ones where he loved the physicality, physicality of it. Um, and they're the ones where you go, well, I've tried plan A, I've tried plan B, I don't know what plan C is. Because, he's, you know, he, he always, I think in the, all the times I've played against him, I probably had one, one and a half good games where I felt good. All the other ones, are just, when, when is the 90 minutes over? You know, you look at, start looking, <laughs> looking at the clock going, oh, God. Um, and he had all, um, I think, and, and people will, you know, probably have similar attitude to mine where, header and then you go in and try and uh, attack a corner he would clear defensively um, then he would run a channel and then you get your next 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 play you get yourself in a channel to cover that move and he goes short and you're like, oh and he's constantly rattling around in your brain where you just don't know what you what he did and that's not a very nice place to be on a pit when you're just not sure how to position yourself against someone like good is that are we coming to a conclusion then that maybe people generally broadly um who talk about him talk a little bit too much about his physicality and his power and his height because you've just described somebody who's got all of those elements but you've talked about his wit his brain his, his game management his, his ability to to make you do things you didn't want to do is is that a little bit underappreciated in Drogba? I think generally yeah I mean the first thing people would say when you talk about Drogba is oh he was a beast I agree with that for sure but he was ridiculously clever clever footballer and he did some Clever goals, clever plays. He would drag you out of position for other players to then run in. Or, you know, he had, he had it all going on. And just to sort of, to say he was only just a beast, it's, it's a, it's a massive, massive... It's lazy. I, I, I want to move on now. I, I, I guess time, you know, for me, I'd ask you for another five hours of this. But I guess your life demands that time's running out. So I want to hit two more sections, if you'll allow it. You're a privileged guy in the... Um, when um, we started and Richard asked the question about that day against Charlton, a name got mentioned in Makaleli. And I know you didn't ask what pisses me off, but what pisses me off in English football language is how, first of all, a central midfield position got called the Makaleli position, as if everybody was going to play a lot of Makaleli. And then it's also just called the holding position, as if in a central midfield all you want to do is stop the tide rather than maybe restart um, an attack or position yourself brilliantly so you're an option. Okay, hold it. Anyway, that level of vocabulary to me is part of the problems about UK football that we need to be a little bit more lateral thinking, a bit more expansive. Maybe it's a problem in football journalism, I don't know. But you've played with um, both Makaleli and Angolo Kante, who seem to me to have football brains about that position that role that at least are reminiscent of one one another I'd like you to, to talk us through the two players if you don't mind particularly given that often you'd be playing behind them maybe not directly behind them but they'd be a first line of organization in front of you at center half and to begin this section what is that position in Spain it's called the pivote because they take a lot of basketball ideas that position generally what's it called in German number six number six number six in the in the sort of Ajax numbers mean positions manner of thinking yeah number six um, 
But I mean, when Makalele certainly came to Chelsea, but the games changed a bit more with the sort of a bit more attacking, you know, the fullback starting to get, get a bit more forward. So that, that position came so important to Chelsea at the time because, you know, we had the fullback going with Pereira, we had Wayne Bridge, we had Ashley Cock. Oh, no, Ashley Cock would not play with him. But these sort of players that were defenders, but they're starting to, you know, get into the final third, leading positions open. And that sort of change of, of game, game play just required that sort of player just to have a bit more of an eye about plan B, the backup. You know, you've got the, all these things going on around you. And it's, it's great when, you, when you're attacking, but you also need pe- players to have that thing. Shit. What if he doesn't beat him? Where do I need to be to make sure we stay there? Or if we completely use the ball, I'm there then to break it up. I even make a foul, win the ball back, or just get into a position that was is now left open. Where I think Kante differs from Makaleli is I think Kante sort of has that sort of ability to step in a bit more, uh, where you know he intercepts a ball and then he makes instant five, six, ten yards, and he's of you know. He, you know, he would have he breaks that line of, you know, of the midfield, and he's he's got that sort of open pitch in front of him where he could pass it to someone a bit more attacking. But um, but again, he doesn't get the credit he deserves. I think for you know, in the UK today, a couple of days ago, we're saying oh, he's not really that sort of him or Declan Rice. I'm like, it's Kante all day long, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, yeah. no, there's nothing Kante can't do that that, that, that like Declan Rice can do. I mean, if there was a big game today, I know who I can, who I would play, um, and it's it's Kante. Don't you think that applies your your logic that you've done there? I think, and I don't know how widely you watch European football. I'm only a journalist, you know, the footballer. But in my eyes, I think you could repeat the argument you've made there about Kante in the majority of elite midfields around Europe. I think he's got so many talents, such vision and such a brain. Okay, remorseless energy too. That's until he's. He said a little bit of injury difficulties recently. He stands out as a player who could drop into any elite side in the last 20 years across any of the leagues. And I think he doesn't just flourish. I think he makes that team a winning team. Title or not is not relevant because there's 11 men in a team, 24 men in a squad. But I, I, don't, I don't understand that. And also I don't understand that after what he's done for Chelsea, for Leicester, for the national team. How can anybody not put him as one of the diamond footballers of our last 20, 25 years. I agree with all, you know, all of it. And he's such an intelligent player. The one negative is that he's such a good footballer that even when he'd been played out of position, he still kind of looks good. So when um, Sarri was at Chelsea, for instance, and he played him that sort of weird position, and he still looked good. He didn't look as good as, you know, like someone who's been playing that position for years and years and years, but he still looked 95% of the player. And that's the only <laughs> negative I can think of where you could probably put him left midfield. I mean, our best example, we had him at, at Leicester and we didn't know where to put him for the first sort of 10 games. So we put him left midfield and he was the best player on the pitch by a mile. <laughs> and, you know, we had uh, Gurkhan Inla at the time sort of playing in that holding position that we sort of needed. And it took a few games to change it. And then I thought he was brilliant playing on the wing for, for us. And then you put him in front of me, I was thinking, oh, this is all right. Go on, son. Go on, son. But the, like I said, the get the, the the sort of interception and and the way he, he gets himself in positions where he just stops attacks is I can't think of someone who's who's been in my time anyway who's been as good as that. Um, and again, people were probably saying he's got that crazy energy, which you need in that position. But I mean, half of the time he doesn't even need that energy because it, he he's read it. Well, is it like I don't know if you're a strictly come dancing fan, but if you're the centre half behind Kante on form in the number six position, are you kind of moving in tune? Is it is it like uh, he's going there, I'm going with him, and it, 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 all right, you're you're vertically rather than face to face, but is your mind going yeah? It, as it's coming at me, he's making the first decision, and therefore I'm reacting to his decisions about where I need to be. That space, that space, is is that right or wrong? It, it probably helped me staying in my position rather than than sort of being out of it because what he was exceptional at or was what he is exceptional is, is sort of that that breakdown recovery of spotting 
where the op- when the opposition wins the ball, he spots it mm. better than no one where where the ball's going to go. So rather than me reacting to that, I only react to Kante going and sort of sniffing out that danger, as you say, in football. That allows me to stay in my position, which ultimately gives the whole team a lot more stability rather than shape. Rather than me now being out of position and there's this big hole here and they're breaking, it just... It, 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 it stops where he sits in that sort of shape and he, he did that. He had that ability just to go, but well, he's clear with a header from a corner, it's going to go there. So therefore, I'm going. And it just allowed or allowed us to sort of stay in that sort of shape. Because you, you see sometimes, I mean, you know, when defenders get pulled out wide, that's when the shit happens, isn't it? Most of the time, you know, defender, centre halves being out on the wing against someone a bit more tricky, they're getting done and all of a sudden you're in your box and you you know, you're looking to to hang on there. But with Angolo he was um he just read danger so so perfectly. The last one on him is that you've been we've noticed we we do a little bit of work before these interviews, whether it shows or not, and we've noticed how popular you've been in every dressing that you've been in. And it's easy to understand why popular with fans too, revered. It it appears that Angolo, although he's a very different guy from you, um it appears that there's something about him that's deeply infectious, apart from the, the fact that he makes everybody else's job on the pitch easier and you're more likely to get win bonuses and medals. But those, those little things aside, he, he was the guy that the French squad composed a song about and lifted off the pitch and all thought that he was the number one reason they won the World Cup. There are legion tales from fans about N'Golo Kante just being a diamond bloke. It is. What's your version of as a bloke, not just as a footballer? You know what? If I'm honest, I, I probably have spoken to him apart from obviously on the pitch. You know, just a limited amount of time. It was just not because I don't like him. It's just the fact that he's so quiet. You know, he's so respectful of of his surroundings. You know, he would just sit there having lunch and sort of well, he just eat his lunch, um, then say goodbye <laughs> and let's go. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and I don't mean in the negative. It's just like. At yeah, first, yeah. I thought if he was a bit rude, you know, like normally we have lunch, we have a chat, and his English got better, so he definitely understood what we were saying and all that stuff. I just thought it was a bit rude, but that was just his personality, it was really unassuming. This uh, this last section to sign off on, and um, I promise you, I don't want to, is is a choice. Well, I've never offered a guest a choice before, but I'm I'm deadly interested in two things. The arrival at Leicester when they make the signing of the century because they're about to go down and you and the others and Pearson save them, that section. Or I'm fascinated by you working for Klinsmann and Germany hosting a World Cup and you're what they call in Spain titular. You're the, your first choice in five Confederation Cup games, which are all dull, boring, nil-nil draws. And you play against Adriano and Ronaldinho, and that must have been at the young ebullient Chelsea champion stage. That must have been a hell of an experience in your own country, followed by a World Cup where you played a different amount of time. Uh, Robert, whichever subject interests you most? Probably Klinsmann, actually. Um, yeah, that sort of journey, because again, he was an innovator um, for the German FA. Really, uh, he, he sort of saw the game with a disastrous Euros two thousand four where Germany took a good hard look at themselves and thought, well, this is, this is not going to be a way forward. You know, everything was a bit slow, a bit sort of... So he came in and he brought this sort of um, American uh, performance team with him. Not, you probably would have heard it in the uh, African performance they were called back in the day. I don't know if I might have changed names. So he brought them in and uh, all of a sudden it was... You, you, you're getting judged on results, you know, not on... Um, not on name, not on on past games. You know, we 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 did the sprint tests. We did all these sort of performance related tests. Where well, if we Germany want to have success over the next sort of 10, 10 years or whatever, this is the sort of players we need. We we don't need any slow centre backs or big number nines. We need a bit more, a bit more flair, a bit more agility in the game, a bit more all this sort of stuff. And then he brought that in, and again. He sort of, you know, the, the the time where he could hide behind what he could be or but, but who you actually are, he exposed it and everyone everyone stood up. And that sort of linked in straight away with, with Mourinho with me because 2004, 
you know, I've had exposure to that sort of, you know, the level of, of judgment of, of, of your performance. When I got called up for, for the national team, it was like, awesome, brilliant. I've done all these tests before, just been, you know, all this. So he was a big fan because, believe it or not, back in the day, I was quite fast. Um, probably, <laughs> probably won't believe me now, but... I'm old enough to remember having seen you and knowing how fast you were. And because I was reporting on the beat then and I was going to uh, World Cup 2006... Um, to work for a Chinese agency, I watched a lot of and and sorry, I'll butt out, but my supplementary is going to be about Klinsman and and the dish th- But yeah, you were so that your speed was one of the things that he liked in you, and and often well certainly in the Confeds Cup, you were uh, you were paired with Mertesacker because he played in England and he understands the passion, the, you know the sort of aggressivity that was played in that day. You know, I, I remember speaking to him he goes. That's exactly what I want in your team. You bring something a bit different. You know, you, you bring the sort of tough tackling. I don't mean that when I mean tough tackling, not the ones where you just smashing players about, but, you know, the real sort of the aggressivity to win the ball back. Um, and that's, he said, that's what, that, that's what I need. As well as Germany being able to play a little bit higher. Because um, at the time, Germany were sort of, you know, it happens to everyone. You, you have to sort of generation. 2004 was one of them where, the, the back four was way old and slow. And that's just the nature of the of the game, of the sport. You know, you, the older you get, the slower you get. And you always got the young, hungry ones fighting for your position. And that was me at the time. And you just wanted to change the style, uh, bring a bit more pace in. You saw that sort of change of, of style. Um, and it, it's still there now. They've still got the, um, the team working for the German FA now. They're still sort of monitoring all that stuff. Um, so it's something that wasn't just an innovative innovation it's something that that stayed you know it wasn't just a let's just try this for world cup or for euro it was is a prolonged change of german football correct me if i'm wrong at that time i seem to remember i'm not sure if i've got my my bodies right but the, the dfb are those who appoint the national team coach right the dfb is, is that right that's the the fa in germany the dfb um i seem to remember that there was a pretty big debate now whether that was just me from a distance seeing old fogies, old, old conservatives in, in the football media. Or, but I, I thought that with Clinsey coming in um, with what he proposed to do, coming in from America, I think he was felt to have been a bit uppity because he was a, he's a, I mean, he was a fabulous, one of the great post-war German footballers stands out in, in an elite group. But he, I think he was regarded as a little bit uppity, a bit of a hippie. And to get him into post, I think it took pr- pretty hard work from a certain group of people in DFB against, not a tidal wave, but against scepticism of conservatism. Is that wrong? No, no, you're right. Uh, and the press probably uh, were on the front foot, you know, angling that sort of agenda against him saying, you know, he's a very smart guy, you know, really, really smart. And he's just open for new ideas. And at that time, you know, it probably wasn't <laughs> so well thought after in Germany because he, he came with these crazy ideas, uh, Crazy, not crazy, absolutely normal now, but you know, like just nutrition value, all these sort of stuff, which is completely normal now. But back in the day, he was like, no, nah, but that's that's not how we do it here, you know, that sort of old school attitude. It's just we've always done it this way, so we keep doing it. And he was sort of, no, we need to change, we need to do this, we need to do that. But the, where where it's down for so was we lived in LA, you know, I think he's got an American wife. Um, and he would fly in for the games and then fly out for the games. And I think that was sort of the biggest sort of anti klinsman agenda. You know, it was like you lose you lose a game and then the next morning he flies off to yeah, to Southern California and then you can you can just see the, the guy behind the laptop going, Well, we lost in Germany and he doesn't care, he's all you know, when really if you know him, he'd be watching the game back on his twelve hour flight, speaking to people, getting Getting different views in, and, and and all that for all that stuff not to happen again. But there's some really intelligent journalists like yourself, and there's some stupid ones that just make up ridiculous stories to just drive a stupid agenda. But um, he was as focused um, and as prepared as he can be living out there, and clearly getting to a, a semi final back home um, at the time. Don't think many of many of us expected to be there. Let me let me close up this section and, and the interview on two things. Then, it, it, does it stick in your mind about playing in the Confeds, which was a roller coaster of three nils, four threes, two twos? But you play against a hidden guy 
in Adriano, who, who at his peak was a, was a devastatingly fun, interesting, clever forward. And you had a Ronaldinho just in the Confeds, uh, coming to his peak just before he falls off and goes partying with Deco and whatever. And you played that team and you lost a, a thriller fight too. I, I'd, I'd like to know if there are memories of those footballers and the test that they gave a young Robert Hood. And I have to then close on Thursday, 4th of July, 2006, one of the most momentous, outstanding games I've ever been present at in, in, in Dortmund, where... In the end, it's Germany nil, Italy too, in a stadium where Germany have never lost a competitive match before. But that is one of the mentalest, most beautiful games of football, as painful as it is for the Mannschaft and the rest of the nation. That was just, that's that's what makes people write opera. But Brazilians first, if you've got any memories of Adriano, the Emperor and, and Ronaldinho. I actually made my full debut against Brazil back home um, in, in Berlin. Um, that was actually my first start for the national team. I probably remember that one more than the Confederations Cup for some, well, well first, I'm guessing. The end, I just got told in the afternoon, you're playing, I didn't think I'd, I'd get a sniff in. And, and, and again, Jung was sort of, that's sort all. Of, well, I've got this young, hungry 20-year-old and everyone was expecting I, I wasn't going to get a game. And he just went, oh, come on, go on, Rob, get your boots and you're playing, which was great. You know, because if I had a night to sleep on, I would have probably shit my pants. But, <laughs> um, so it was pretty cool to get my, my Germany debut back home in Berlin. But same, they had, um, they had the, the original Ronaldo playing, who was one of my all-time favourite sort of idols. Uh, he played, uh, Ronaldo, Ronaldinho played, Roberto Carlos played. They all played and I'm just sort of... Do, do you want me to read you the team? Do you want me to read to the team on Wednesday, 8th September, in the Olympia Stadion, Berlin? Uh, Julio Cesar, Rocky Jr., Edmilson, Belletti, Juan, Roberto Carlos, Edu, Janino Jun- Pernambucano, Ronaldinho, Ron- Ron- Ronaldinho, Ronaldo, Adriano. Coached by the, the extremely successful and interesting Carlos Alberto Pereira. And when Clinsey gave you your shout, it's with Oliver Kahn, Frank Farenhorst, who I'd forgotten about, Hinkle, who played at Sevilla, Yourself, Philip Lamb, Tustin Frings, Sebastian Deisler, who had such a tortured um, personal life. Bernd Schneider, good Leverkusen footballer, I think made the Champions League final against Madrid, I think. Balak, who did the same. Kevin Kurani, Gerald Asamoa, um, and substitute Gorlitz, Klose and Podolski, of course. And 1-1. One, 1-1 one. One, one it finishes. 1-1, one, one, yeah. We go 1-0 down the early doors. One idea your free kick right in the top corner. And I'm thinking, oh, here we go. <laughs> this is going to be my, my first game. We get spanked at home. I've got everyone in the everyone in the stadium. Um, but, yeah, I mean, talking about surreal. You know, they're, they're, they're the guys that you watch on TV. I see, obviously, Ronaldo scoring against Germany in the 2002 World Cup. Bitter memories and all that stuff. But, yeah, I mean, I was just, I was like a, you know, in a dream being on a pitch, not pinching yourself because you're in the morning, but it's, I, I loved it. And you hear sometimes people freezing or get nervous, but I, just, I was loving it. I'm thinking about the pride of people um, who knew you growing up in Beersdorf and, and got to go to the Olympic Stadium t- to watch you coming off um, on even terms at 20 with three of the greatest Brazilian footballers there's ever been. That ain't bad. That ain't bad. And without causing too much pain, I saw you recognise what I was talking about in that, although it's a painful uh, German night, that game against Italy um, was, you know, it, Italy perhaps man for man, you might say, certainly they were more, they were more experienced at winning at club level. There were, there were footballers there who'd just been serial winners. You had Lippi, who clearly is one of the, the, the great coaches of modern times. And yet the game... It is just delicately balanced, and it's blow for blow. It's tactical, but it's not a stalemate that, that you know you would misinterpret by looking at it nil nil until the hundred and nineteenth minute. And Lippi puts on sixteen. For, it's Italy, and he, he puts on sixteen forwards and plays with one at the back. He rolls the dice and he gets his reward, which is a pain in the arse for for Robert, who's sitting on the bench with Novotny and and hits another guest on this. So, I don't know if you retain things from that night, apart from the pain. What I remember is probably not Lippi putting on all the strike. I just remember, remember um, Calabaro's performance on that day. You know, you're looking back at, like, individual performance of, of any player at any time and at any level, but that guy was just insane. And I think, if I remember correctly, I think he even set up the second one. He, he, he stepped into midfield, won the ball, 
then we won the ball back. We crossed it. He won the header. Um, then stepped in again, played the ball to uh, Del Piero, and he put it in the top corner. That level performance in a semi final was just, I know Grosso will get the, the mention, and, and obviously Del Piero with the finishing 2 0, of course. But I mean, everyone in the Italy squad master just looked at him going, that was insane, because I did. Um, and I was just, I remember in the second half, we had a free kick, and uh, Kinsley said, if we score this, you're coming on. Um, so I was like, <laughs> you know, like, just like, <laughs> I didn't know whether I was happy or I was shitting it. I was like, I was just like, oh, God. So, because it was always going to be a game that whoever scores first wins the game. I've, I always said that feel to it. That's the way sort of we prepared. Um, and unfortunately, went to Italy and they obviously went on to win it. But we don't normally beat Italy in, in a big tournament. Uh, it was only last year that we did in the Euros. Uh, yeah, so I was always up against it, but but again, you know, we're talking about sort of learning from mistakes, learning from losing big games and all that sort of stuff. So we lost obviously the semi final in 2006, lost the final to Spain, uh, 2008, Torres scored, lost the semi final again to Spain, where Carlos Puya scored the amazing header, got to the semi final again at the Euros, where we lost, beaten by Italy, beaten by, beaten by Mario beaten by Mario having a mental 35 minutes and then they're exhausted and you look like you're going to win, you look like you're going to win and it just doesn't... And then you get to 2014 and you finally arrive at the World Cup final and you win it, you know, so we're talking from 2006 till mm-hmm. 2014, you know, mm-hmm. that's a lot of tough losses to take to take on board individually and the team were young, so, um, you know, talking about learning from your mistakes and sort of doing it the right way. I mean, they must have, looking back on that period, you know, losing to Spain twice in a massive yeah. game. Uh, three times, actually, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. three times. But, I mean, you must have thought it's never going to happen. Um, so it's that sort of, you know, don't don't give up, keep believing, you know, you, we're going to get there. That resilience, you know, you're not going to be judged by loss. You know, you, you're going to have the chance again to do it. And yeah, I mean, that was a, that was a pretty cool moment beating Brazil 2014-71, but, um, yeah, but they finally got there, um, and they sort of they reached that that peak that teams get. Um, you know, when a World Cup doesn't get any better now. It it doesn't. I wish it had been you, <clears throat> but we can't do anything other than say that um, the reason we've asked you on it, apart from meeting you in London, was that you've gone an enormous amount um, to the game in England, N- not just with your trophy wins. Uh, and, and and champion with two different clubs is an exceptional thing for Henry to achieve. But your personality and your attitude, and I don't know what's going to come next. This is the end of the interview. You've talked about mentoring. I've heard your scepticism a number of times about modern coaching and whether to coach or not. But I really genuinely hope that as soon as it's pleasing to you, that you're adding your football perspective and knowledge back into the gene pool somewhere. Because I think it's quite important if we've both identified things that we don't understand or like about football development, football ideas, it is quite important that you find the right way to channel back what you can share and teach and impose on people. That's something that you you, you kind of got to do. But I don't know which is the best way for you to do it, I admit. I'm, I'm fortunate to take a bit of time off to think about how, how I'm going to do the next move. But um, I'm doing the sporting directorship at uni at Manchester, so that's something I'm I'm keen on learning, you know, the behind the scenes stuff. But yeah, there's so many different ways of football, and we just don't know when and how football is going to be open for 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 sort of these sort of changes. Because still, quite a bit of old school thinking that's going on. Well, meantime, um, this has been a pure joy. Our, our listeners um, will definitely agree with that. We owe you a lot for being so generous with your time, but also just outright the big thing says I've enjoyed that absolutely it, 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 it teaches me challenges me and occasionally you made me laugh Mr H thank you very much <laughs>